Hello everyone and welcome again to our lecture series Mobility Analysis and Planning for the Human Scale Cities. We have now reached our final week of the uh, public online lecture series and uh, today in this semi-final event uh, in the series we are most delighted to welcome here uh, Dr. Huyen Le from the Ohio State University, uh, United States. Uh, Dr. Le is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and a co-faculty member in the Sustainability Institute at the Ohio State University. Her work focuses on three major themes, sustainable urban transportation, physical and mental health outcomes resulting from the exposure during daily travel and activities, and the impacts of information and communication technology on transportation, energy efficiency, and other environmental outcomes. Dr. Lee is a member of Trellis and Golden Compass, which are the two initiatives aiming to train and promote women scholars in geospatial sciences. Her today's lecture is titled, How do activity space and exposure to environmental risks affect well-being? We will hear about her research conducted in this field in the North American context. If you have questions during the lecture or during the discussion phase, please post them on the questions and answers uh, section in the chat. We will have the Q&A session in the end of the lecture. The recording will also be recorded or the lecture will also be recorded and it will be later accessible from the uh, lecture series website transportplanning.ut.ee. And now, uh, we, have let, uh, we are most happy to give the floor to you. And um, yes, we, are, we look forward to your lecture. So please. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, and thank you, Dr. Palm and college for, uh, colleagues for uh, organizing such a wonderful lecture series. Um, I'm Huyen Le, and it's, it's very honor and great pleasure for me to, to be able to share my research with you today. Um, and so I'm going to present um, some snippets of our research on activity space, environmental exposure and well-being. And um, in the context of in the US context, and we compare across multiple um, cities. So to give you a little bit of background, although I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this already, is the, the you know, the relationship between transportation and health. And we can take a look at that from two um, categories for physical health and mental health. So it's very obvious that transportation is linked to the level of physical activity. So for those who travel by bike or walking, um, this is the increased level in physical activity, but there's also a an increase in sedentary lifestyle among car drivers. Um, there's also a stream of studies related to environmental exposure, especially to environmental hazards such as air pollution, noise and crashes. But the link between transportation and mental health is still less studied, less explored as compared to that to the physical health domain. Um, so here we are looking at, you know, transportation related well-being. Um, hedonic well-being is one of them, and it is the kind of uh, represented by the, the absence of pain and the presence of, of positive emotions and positive feelings, um, absence of negative ones. And that is around the concept of hedonic well-being. Um, there are other studies in the past that also uh, did several studies related to eudaimonic well-being. So if you think of um, purpose in life or fulfillment or things that you desire to do in the long term, um, that is uh, kind of some example of eudaimonic well-being. Um, it's not the focus of my presentation today, though. I'm, I'll be focusing on mental well-being from the hedonic um, stream. There's also the link between activity look uh, participation and, and mental well-being. Apparently, mobility, daily mobility allows us to participate in or engaging in a socialization, to, to see friends and family, um, allows us to access to opportunity for career or education and so on. So with the lack of mobility brings the, the social um, isolations uh, and mental um, you know, the, the deprivation in mental well-being. 
So this is this is a serious issue that's been studied a lot in the literature as well. Last study though is the exposure to the environment and how that is related to mental health. Um, and so their study about traffic stress uh, or, or tra exposure to traffic or uh, time spent on traffic, how that relates to stress, um, I think it's been studied for decades. Um, also not the focus of our study here, but uh, I'm going to present some findings related to exposure to noise, air pollution, and some kind of uh, more positive environments such as green space with more restorative effects. So a little bit of background on environmental exposure. Of course, when we think about environmental exposure, more likely we think of the harmful effects. So uh, five particulate matters, especially uh, well, which is the particulate matters with diameters of 2.5 micrometers or smaller. So those are very small, tiny particles that can be absorbed in, in our body and um, have very harmful effects to cardio, um, you know, has or increased the risk to cardiovascular diseases and respiratory diseases. And also there are more and more linked to neurological and some psychological impacts as well. So as we think of exposure during travel, um, although we don't, it could be like a small dose, 8% of daily exposure uh, to PM2.5 every day uh, from daily travel and their study by uh, authors like Park and Kwan, some study from our groups, uh, brought it out. We found that this is have significant impacts on especially on cyclists and pedestrians. Um, if we think it's just 8%, it's not much, but uh, if we think we repeatedly exposed to uh, air pollution cumulatively over time, and we do this about 20, 25 days a week, that's a lot. Uh, sorry, 20, 25 days per month, that's a lot uh, cumulatively. There's also studies that looked at the noise um, negative effects on, on well-being. Um, there's also studies on crash risk and traffic related stress, and that increased a lot in kind of not just psychologically, but also physically um, for, for sleep disturbance. Um, and, and, and higher uh, cardiovascular risks as well. So I want to point out to uh, a really great review articles by Dr. Palm and colleagues um, on possible pathway of, of linking from environment and measuring environmental exposure. So in terms of well-being, um, which is another piece of, of research I'm going to link between well-being and exposure. Um, first, let me take a step back and think about all the literature. I'm not presenting all the literature, but some of the literature of findings that are focused on different modes of travel. So, so far we know that active travelers are usually more satisfied with their travel than car users or public transport riders. And that means there are some disparities in among mode users. Um, and there's also there's disparity or variation in the exposure to the type of environments that travelers are going through that could be higher or more positive in natural environment, but lower um, or negative mood in built environment or very dense urban area. And um, I like to emphasize a lot of the studies are in uh, the American context, some others are in European, but um, that said, also I need to qualify that there's also a variability in the kind of built environment um, as well. So how do we explain this? How do we explain that there's better, uh, you know, higher mood or more positive mood in the natural environment versus lower mood in uh, built up environment? Um, Kaplan, with his attention restoration theory, postulates that in the uh, built environment or urban dense populous environment, there are more stimulations that could really stimulate or deplete our cognitive resources. Meanwhile, in the natural environment, there's fewer or no such stimulations. Therefore, we, we still can preserve our cognitive resources and uh, we are able to, to restore our energies. 
So how do we measure mobility in order to, to create this link between, say, how do we move, how when we move in space and exposed to the environment, then how do we link that to uh, to, to mental well-being? So that signifies, you know, we, we necessitate the, the need to measure this mobility. And here I rely on the you know decades old concept of activity space, and you might be familiar with this. So I'm going to introduce just a, a brief some of the key measures that might be relevant to what I'm going to present later. But I'm going to refer you to Smith et al. review papers, really good paper on uh, activity space and physical activities. It's not specific to mental well-being or exposure, but it's really good uh, review of the different types of activity space measure. So the common one is, let me change the pointer. Uh, the common one is to derive the buffer. This is the daily path area. So basically the idea is that, okay, we have GPS traces and dots, small dots here, and we can derive the buffer around along the routes, along the activity locations in orange. Um, that will be our activity space. Other approaches include, um, there could be standard deviation ellipse or some other measures such as confidence ellipse. So basically we would derive an elliptical area around these activity locations and the focal point of this uh, ellipse usually lie on you know, the, the average place where people spend most of the time or more frequently spend their time there. So usually that's home location or a share between home and work. Or some other measures such as convex halls, so basically we derive a polygon that connect all the farmers' dots. Um, so anything like every single activity locations, every single place this person visited will fall into this polygon. So we, we have this called convex hole, or we interpolate making lines out of it. So there are studies that use activity space in you know physical health, physical activities, but less so in you know to link with uh, with mental well-being. So there are some studies that found limited activity space associated with depression. I'm not um, I'm not saying here there's any causal relationship. This is totally statistical correlation, right? It may be that a person who are depressed uh, less likely to make trips outside of their home area, and therefore you know when we measure that they we can see fewer trace. So here activity space is a good geographical representation of all the places a person visits in uh, within the study period. Um, now about uh, what about other measures of activity space? There could other study also found that spatial mobility patterns. Um, so here we can measure that in terms of distance traveled or entropy. I'm going to talk about entropy in a bit. It's, it's more like uh, a measure of variability in terms of sequence of visits. So if, if we have high entropies, meaning the person kind of changing their pattern a lot, uh, as opposed to those with lower entropies, that person might follow pretty kind of predictable, uh, very regulated um, sequence of visit to places. Or ir irregularity is, uh, Irregularity is, is a kind of another measure to see how often person travel out uh, and making trips and so on. So all of this uh, also found to, to be linked with anxiety or affect or stress um, and, and irregularity is also related to depression and loneliness. And again, no claim for causal relationship that might well be that the person who are depressed or lonely tend to stay in their uh, home environment more often than others or making trip less often. So I like to emphasize a number of research gaps, but let's start with the kind of no-brainer, the things the obvious. That could be the lack of standardized measure for travel emotions during travel. Now there's thankfully there are studies um, uh, from Freeman et al. Uh, Glasgow et al. This is the second study is from our groups where we derive um, a travel mood scales to measure 
uh, emotions and feeling and satisfaction during travel. Uh, we also tested Fremont adults uh, very well known skill called satisfaction with travel skill and has been used widely in the European context. Um, so we adapted both. Um, we ad admitted that uh, the European scale didn't work super well in our sample, so therefore we, we used our own sample, our own skills in the later study. Um, but that said, there's still some limitation in terms of measuring them. There's also a lack of real time and repeated measure emotions and satisfaction. So think about traditional studies where we go out and, and survey people online or uh, with a paper based survey. It's, it's usually one time and we don't have the kind of a detail variation in time because emotions, a lot of these are momentary. So we have a strong reaction to something and a few hours later, we totally forgot about it. So it's, it's really have a lack of this real time repeated measure. We want to be able to capture all this variability um, when we, we have this emotional reaction to certain environment. There's also a past study uh, well reliant on the cell report surveys or, uh, you know, versus using the objective measure of mobilities. So it's more like we we asking respondents to recall the number of trips that they make, how far they drove or go by certain modes. And, you know, human memories are not reliable. Um, we have a tendency to, to overestimate certain things and underestimate others. There's also a lack of comparisons among trip purposes. Um, a lot of studies, if they really care about certain kind of trips, they usually focus on commuting trip or leisure trips. Um, and there's a lot of great studies on this, but they're still, because of the kind of surveys that were used, just limit the ability to incorporate other kind of trip purposes or kind of compare among all sort of trip purposes. So we need, you know, repeated measure. We need kind of more real time. We need to ask them every single thing that they did during the day in order to capture all of this. Um, also, past study tends to focus on single city um, and smaller sample size, which is totally understandable because in order to capture all of this, um, you know, repeated measure things or to have really um, good, good, good kind of uh, data set uh, for environmental exposure, it's really a tall order in terms of data collection. And uh, usually because of that, we result in pretty small sample size. Um, and we also have a lack of considerations for multiple pathways. So I'm going to go deeper into that here. So many studies still only use one environmental risk or benefit, either focus on fine particulate matter, either focus on noise, either focus on heat, either focus on green space. So there's still a lack of comprehensive consideration of all these benefits and risks. So do what if this strong emotional reaction is to both air pollution and to noise and to green space uh, or because of the presence of green space, the, the emotional reaction was was mediated. Um, and then a lot of studies also focus on the home locations, which is a static way of, of measuring exposure. But the fact that people are highly mobile and we inhale a substantial amount of air pollution during daily travel, that leads to the, the potential biases um, that we might over or underestimate the, the true amount of uh, inhaled doses of air pollution or exposure to noise and so on. If we only assume that people stay home for most of their time, you know, and we know that's not true. Um, so as opposed to that static measure, we can do, we can shift the focus to dynamic exposure, which is now that we care about human mobility, we put this uh, daily mobility in the picture and we focus on where they go and how much they are exposed to wherever they go. Now this is, this gives us the advantage of looking at equity analysis, which is a, a big deal in, in the study context in the US because of several reasons that uh, marginalized population of racial minority immigrants, um, low income people are more likely to live in polluted area. 
this is the result of discriminatory planning practices in the US. We dumped dirty uh, pollution sources, highway, etc., in the low income neighborhoods. And uh, for decades, uh, it hasn't been fixed. There's also uh, a big proportion of people who are not who do not have cars or who do not have access to a car on a regular basis. They walk, bike or using public transit. These are people of low income and marginalized population. And these people tend to have higher exposure. They travel longer. Um, there's no good infrastructure for them. And there's a mix in traffic and they're in here higher dose of exposure if they are in the same space with car. So that this kind of analysis can be can only be enabled by using dynamic exposure. In other words, so we had to take into account the exposure during uh, daily mobilities. So here I'd like to introduce uh, our two studies. Um, the first one, well, the aim of both study is to understand the impacts of exposure to environmental hazards um, and, and to positive things such as green space on the momentary well-being during daily travel. And we focus on the hazards such as pipe particulate matter or nitrogen dioxide or traffic noise. Now, the two studies are a different kind of in the same goals and the same aims, but we kind of measure things slightly differently and we conduct it in different cities. So that would give us a you know a bigger picture of like how things go. Does this result really can be replicatable in other cities or, or its measurement is good enough? Is there anything we could improve? Uh, do we have enough evidence to say, well, this exposure to this thing really badly negatively affect well-being? So the first study, we look at the trip level. We focus on activity space and exposure to air pollution and green space. We use lower spatial resolution data. In the second study, Quite similar, but now we use day level analysis instead of trip level, and we, we focus on the cumulative exposure to noise to air pollution in green space. So we add the noise component to it. And in addition, we use higher resolution data. And we try to compare the two. If there's any consist inconsistency, would that be because of the way we measure it? So let's go into each of them. The first study, we look at activity space and exposure to green space and air pollution. So we go out and collect the data. Um, there's a few places in the US. This is, we started out with Blacksburg, Virginia and Roanoke, Virginia. These two are kind of, you know, small size, medium size city, pretty typical US. And we also collected data in Washington DC metropolitan areas that includes part of Northern Virginia and Maryland, if you know the geography of, China, of the US. But basically, this is a huge capital, you know, national capital region. So it's 1.6 million people living here. We have a good representation of different travel mode and the built environment can change from somewhere kind of semi-rural all the way to suburban to um, very dense uh, urban area and, and you can have very low density to very high density. And then we have Minneapolis on this site. Um, so this is another big city, not as big as Washington DC, but also it gives us another kind of comparison point where uh, the study also have a good range of public transportation um, and uh, there's slightly different demographics. But overall, having four cities in the same board, that gives us a better representation of a lot of built environment, different kind of travel environment and different demographics and so on. So what did we do? We went out and we use a smartphone app called Dynamica. This is developed by my collaborator, uh, Professor Yingling Fan in, at the University of Minnesota. Basically, we had an entry survey where we ask participants to um, to describe their socioeconomic characteristics. We ask for age and income, uh, household composition. We talk about travel patterns, psychological factors, um, their preference of modes, and so on. And then once they 
pass through this entry survey, we ask them to carry this their smartphone, install this app, carry the app around, and the app will track the GPS trace patterns. So everywhere they go, the app is activated. They will it will capture the um, locations, the mode of travel, and everything. Um, and of course, uh, at the end of the trip, when the app detects that oh the trip is ended, now that it will pop out some trip survey, pretty short, and we ask participants to describe um, where they're going to, what mode of travel, um, what they do during the trip, um, what what they do at the destination, um, how do they feel about everything, and we asked a bunch of questions related to that. Um, overall, this is quite hectic data collection. Uh, at the time that we conducted this study, I was the guinea pig of this app, so um, it was it was still developing and we kind of had to work a lot on on troubleshooting and such. It only worked with Android OS at this time. Now it can work with iOS, um, but at the time working with Android that limits our ability to kind of have a representative sample. Um, we tracked participants' movement over one to two weeks from fall 2016 to 2018. So you might say, oh, slightly old. Um, that's true, but that's why we have follow-up study later. So um, what we ended up, when it ended up with, so this is the Virginia NDC sample. This is the Roanoke um, and Blacksburg, Virginia metropolitan areas that I showed you earlier. And this part is Washington DC metro area. So you see the city of uh, the District Columbia is just this part, but there's also the study area. We include a big part of Maryland, a big part of Northern Virginia. Overall, we have uh, more than 3000 trips with completed surveys, but the total number of trips actually being tracked with GPS is 9000. So the uh, we didn't ask participants to report every single thing. It's a, it's a lot to ask uh, at the time. And then we end up with, after cleaning, we had 153 people left that have completed everything and is eligible for all the analysis we want to conduct. Um, and we have 3.6 million of GPS records. In the Minneapolis sample, we have 12,000 trips, uh, everything with completed trip surveys is a lot more successful here. Um, this, this study is quite similar to the previous one, but not exactly the same. Um, so because of that, I'm going to analyze this two um, separately. So we have about 329 people with 2.2 million GPS records. So before we, we jump into result, I want to introduce a bit on how we derive the measures using activity space measure that I introduced a bit earlier. Here we use confidence ellipse, 95%. Uh, we basically, again, this is the focal points lies in the, uh, you know, kind of the mean center where the, this person's visited most frequently and spend most of the time here. So for some people, this is skilled toward home. For some others, like workaholic, that might skill a little bit to work, work and home. Um, but overall, this is where uh, we, we weighted by time. So this is any things that fall into this ellipse uh, represent the most frequently visited um, places and, and also taking into account the time, the duration they spend there. We also use the uh, buffer. So we derive the buffer along the route, and we also derive even bigger buffer around the origin and destinations. This is under the assumption, of course, that we, um, that, that participants who will spend more time at the origin and destination, and they only pass by this environment if the a certain scenery was just along the route. So in other words, where they spend more time, we have higher, uh, long, bigger buffer. Um, we also look at the number of unique locations that each participant visited during the study period. Uh, we look at distance travel and duration and the entropy, which is the variability in their sequence of visits. Um, that represent the you know the regularity in the data as well. 
And uh, of course, we derive green space and water or blue space. Uh, POI is a point of interest. So these are like activity locations or restaurants, um, public school uh, or public places. Um, all of this we derive along the route in 50 meter buffer. And we also derive it along around the origin destination at 500 meters. And we use um, five particulate matter data, uh, nitrogen dioxide, um, the model data at the block group level. And for subjective well-being, we used, uh, we kind of combined positive and negative affects. We take the difference that will be our net affect. So let's see what we find in here. So I, we ran a multi-level regression model in here. Um, I'm not going to present the equation and things, but let's focus on what we find here. I'm happy to answer if you have uh, more question about how we come up with the results. Um, so what we found is that positive uh, net affect is positively associated with green and blue space, which is which is expected. Um, it's also negatively associated with travel time, with commute and errand trips, with other trips that is not commute, errand or shopping. Um, it's also negatively associated with nitrogen dioxide concentration. We did not find any statistical association with the number of points of interest or the ellipse area or number of unique locations or uh, PM 2.5 concentrations. Now, as for the Minneapolis sample, that said, we it's quite similar. It share a lot of commonality with the uh, Virginia DC sample, but still um, because we measure well being slightly differently, I, I like to just make it its own model. And what we found was uh, that net affect is positively associated with green and blue space with the number of unique locations and bike trip and leisure trips. It also negatively associated with NO2 concentrations, and we didn't find any statistical significant association with ellipse area with convex hall with PM 2.5. So apparently the way we we measure kind of um, mobility or activity space also matters in the results. So what we found overall to summarize is that active travel modes are generally associated with stronger well-being and um, but the results in the same sample vary by well-being measurement. Um, we also found that green and blue space boost the net affect, which is consistent with previous studies. Um, but nitrogen dioxide, not the PM2.5, reduced the net affect or associated with lower well-being level. Um, this is perhaps due to the fact that NO2 is heavily traffic related, so it can be emitted from um, vehicle exhaust is also uh, correlated with traffic volume, which is uh, induced, which induces stress. And uh, larger activity space is also associated with stronger well-being, but we only found the significant in the Minneapolis sample. Um, overall, this is my suspicion all along is that measurements really matter. It, look at the way the, how we define the uh, the buffer size, we did also some other tests, uh, the way we derive activity space and so on, and the, the kind of data that we use, the, the resolutions that really kind of uh, may skew the result more or less or, or make the create more null findings. So the next step is to change the measurement level of activity space and exposure. So we get into more high resolution data. We also test the cumulative exposure to well-being at the daily level. So in the first study I just presented, we are looking at the trip level. We're not looking at cumulative, but what about we looking at the well-being at the daily level and we kind of sum up all the exposure during the day. So that's the topic of study number two with exact Aim, uh, with exact same aim, which is to understand how exposure to the environment are associated with well-being. But now we're looking at kind of um, a more comprehensive assessment over the a, a daily period. So here we 
conducted the study in the Columbus, Ohio area. This is a metropolitan area of 2.1 million people. And um, if you're not familiar with the kind of urban context in the US, you have the core city center here um, or the city of Columbus, and then you have a lot of smaller suburban areas. It's also their own cities, but a lot of these people live in this suburb, uh, just commute to work in Columbus. So the whole thing we call it as metropolitan statistical areas um, by the US Census. So what we did is also we rely on an app survey. This is from OHU Daily Mobility Studies in 2019. And uh, the app again is doing uh, the same thing that is tracking GPS. Uh, it does have uh, random sampling and we have trip surveys as well. And as also the unfortunate story is is only work on Android OS. But here we track it over two weeks. And we also start out with a baseline survey asking all these uh, long term um, kind of patterns, including socioeconomic, uh, tribal patterns, uh, psychological factors. And then uh, whenever, you know, during random moment in the day, we also ask people, how do you feel? Uh, what are you doing at the moment? And on top of that, we also ask them about all the trips that they make. So it's already tracked all the trip. What the respondent needs to do is go to the app and kind of select uh, different options there, like how do they feel, what the travel modes that they use, the why they choose a certain route, um, and so on. And then we have an endpoint survey um, to, to, you know, uh, asking more information about personality, about cognitive measures and health. So in this one, we had 14 days of data. We had 45 million, so 45,000 trips and 457 people. We have about 60 million GPS records. Now, the because we do a lot with GPS and we uh, do the statistic of GPS records, um, but really it it really varies a lot by the kind of apps that, that are used to for this data collection and the the way the app is is recording the GPS points. But this is important for us if if we are relying so much on the raw GPS data. Um, that was something I care about the number of points in here. So how did we derive measures? Uh, we we still uh, rely on data of travel time or duration by each mode. So a person bike or walk, they expose more or inhale with a, a higher ventilation rate than a person who's driving or sitting in the passenger seat of the car. Um, we also derive green space along routes at the 100 meter. Now we use higher resolution green space data. Uh, previously, we look at like only parks or big open space. We don't care about backyards. We don't care about um, you know, a, a green path or something like that. But NDVI is a normalized difference vegetation index. It's kind of uh, a way that we measure green space is higher resolution of 30 meter. And this allows us to, to take into account grassland and shrubs and bushes and smaller kind of smaller strip of, of green space. Sometimes it can give you joy. So looking at uh, the garden or the neighbor's backyards, which is not captured in the previous study that we, we didn't consider private green space as part of the green space. Here for air pollution, we use higher resolution. Now we use one kilometer resolution of PM2.5 and NO2, also model data. And we added a comp another component, which is noise, this is the model data from traffic um, simulation. So this is created by the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. For subjective well-being, we measure it slightly differently here. Um, and we aggregated everything below at the daily level. So we, we measure positive well-being, we measure the energy level and stress. And for exposure, we derive all the exposure to the you know, green space, air pollution and noise at the 100 meter buffer along the travel route. Now we sum up all the green space area um, for each person. So imagine this is one person for the one day and we measure all of the green space, noise and air pollution on this green patches. 
and then we sum up all of this, and that would be our cumulative measure. We also kind of to calculate cumulative inhaled doses, we had to uh, we, we multiply with the ventilation rates, we multiply with the time, uh, we take into account the modes and so on. And we also average noise level on each route and aggregated travel time by mode. So what we found here um, is the association between environmental exposure during travel and emotional well-being for some reason it disappear um, for different things. And we found some significant results, uh, some things that is hard, easy to explain and some others are hard to explain. So we found that exposure to green space, to NO2 and noise is associated with higher stress or lower energy, which is expected. But exposure to PM2.5 is associated with lower stress, uh, which is kind of inconsistent with previous finding. Um, so a possible reason is that um, the measurement of environment data like green space, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that green exposure to green space would that result in higher stress is not uncommon, as I thought when I uh, had this piece of result. Um, when I talked to my colleagues and other uh, found out that a lot of researchers also found the same thing in the US is because the NDVI measure, the high resolution one, um, tends to take into account the highway green strips. And in urban area in the US, a lot of grassland, a lot of like uh, tree line streets and things like that are actually uh, highways or arterial roads, and therefore is nothing coming, uh, nothing calm there. It's very stressful. Um, that might be also because of the resolution of the data and the temporally aggregated PM data. So for particulate matters and for NO2, it is sort of um, higher spatial resolution, but not enough temporal resolution. So this kind of dynamic exposure we probably want to rely more on kind of temporal variation as well. And uh, the um, emotional well-being wasn't captured really well here. Admittedly, when we we start out with the study, it wasn't that we had the environmental exposure in mind. It was about um, other things, about personality, about um, emotional reaction uh, uh, when we interact with the mobile phone. So it was totally different. Uh, purpose when we created the study, but with adding more and more components, we were able to see something, although not exactly the thing that we expected. So to summarize this, this two study, um, we um, we look at the exposure to the environment during travel and how that affect well-being, um, either momentary or cumulatively, and um, the pathway and to the short-term well-being is under study is that whether there's, you know, because uh, well, people have lower positive mood or lower well-being levels because they're interacting with the traffic or because of stress from the environment or it's because there's something that the air pollution is doing with, with the brain chemical and imbalance of chemical in the brain. We don't know yet exactly uh, the mechanism of that. Um, and I, after this two study and some more testing of different kind of data, um, my hypothesis here is that data measurement and resolution really matter. And we have tried different kind of resolutions spatially, but really the, the temporal resolution also matter a lot as well. Um, so I, I'd like to point out several implications to the planning practices. Uh, for urban and transportation planning, um, this is a way, this study um, along with a lot of other studies on well-being really kind of emphasize the goal of, of having a more human-focused urban and transportation planning practice. Instead of, you know, focusing on creating a good environment for vehicles to move through, we need to kind of put the human in the center of, of our focus and really trying to optimize or maximize the well-being level um, and create urban environments that really facilitate or improve this well-being. Um, there's also 
this may have some implication for environmental regulations for vehicle emissions. So if, if NO2 is something that matters, not just for physical health, but also mental health, that signifies certain things of, you know, maybe we need to regulate the emissions, vehicle emissions more. Maybe we need to route those large vehicles, relocate pollution sources such as highway or, you know, our, our um, uh, it's all the word come out my my head, but um, major roads, uh, all the major roads and thoroughfares, uh, we need to really uh, be mindful of where to locate those and have to, uh, should have appropriate measure to minimize this impacts. Uh, we also need kind of other mitigation strategies to promote environmental justice. So some limitations of this study, and by no means is this exhaustive list, um, is the non-representative samples. Apparently we are relying on a tech savvy uh, Android user population, and um, we still have some inconsistent results. We really suspect the resolution data uh, in the data really matter. Um, we still do not really understand the, the the real mechanism, the health pathway, and how this, you know, how all of these factors really um, interact with our well-being or our mental health. Um, and then there's also a lack of high spatial temporal resolution air quality data. So the next step, and actually ongoing steps that we are doing, is to uh, look at higher spatial temporal resolution data. Or for the environmental measures. So we use low cost sensors for PM 2.5. We also measure temperature and humidity. We look at short term and long term health measures. Uh, we are surveying people about their mood, anxiety disorder, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, short term symptoms. We also try to link with their medical records. Uh, we create mini cohort designs so we can survey them in 2019. 2021 or 2022, and then perhaps 2024. And we quantify biases reduced by low resolution data. So this is some snippet of our ongoing efforts. My colleague Andy's having the sensor tower in his backyard to, to co-locate the sensors and make sure that they are well calibrated before we send out and uh, locate the sensor around the city. Um, then we have a purple air sensor network in Columbus, in addition to other, you know, uh, number 25 sensors uh, deployed by uh, uh, planning, local planning agencies and individual people. So we have about uh, 50, 60 in total. And this is the prediction service, a PM 2.5 that we built uh, using machine learning. We can predict um, the PM 2.5 concentration uh, at every single location in the city at high spatial resolution and high temporal resolutions. This is this is 100 meter resolution and uh, uh, hourly level, hourly daily level. So with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators. This is the DC, Virginia, Minnesota well-being study um, with Dr. Yingling Fan, Dr. Steve Henke, and Trevor Glasgow. And uh, my other team with the Columbus studies, I thank my students, Amita Carr and Dima Alkashkis, and my collaborator, Andy May and Joe Beyer. So with that, thank you for um, attending this um, talk. And if you have any question, I'm happy to answer that. This, this was really very nice, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, overview. And, and I would even say, um, I wouldn't even say a holistic overview of your research on environmental exposure, uh, its measurements uh, and outcomes, especially on the mental uh, and emotional well-being. Very, very, very happy to have heard all this, uh, uh, Dr. V. Um, v. Thank you very much. So first, uh, now thank we you. have entered. Yes, uh, it's our pleasure. We have now entered the discussion and uh, discussion section. And so uh, should the online audience have any questions to pose, so please use the Q&A um, uh, option uh, in the Teams Live event uh, settings that you have, have over, the, uh, over the screen for online environment. 
But now um, our on site audience here in the classroom. So if any of you have uh, has any questions, so please you can start the discussion. I have one question. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, very nice and interesting uh, presentation. I think I have mostly this uh, methodological uh, questions that if you trust this uh, mobility and ask on the same time the emotions or this uh, what the people fear or think that uh, how is uh, this uh, how you handled of the lack that they don't look this up on the same time as they move. For example, it is safety reasons and also the people don't look the mostly, I hope, don't look the mobile phone all the time. And then it's uh, how, how you put together these emotions and, and the mobility. It means that maybe they, uh, they look this uh, your question uh, some hours later and they don't uh, uh, know anymore what they feel in this green area or this uh, using some transportation modes. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's, it's quite a long question, so I <laughs> uh, is there um, I could could you repeat part of that if, if that's OK with you? Yeah, I mean that uh, how you handle that if it's uh, that they have they move to people, move if you track them from this uh, app that you described that the, and if you and then you then you ask some questions about the, their emotions or what they feelings and how you put this uh, uh, together. I, I mean that uh, uh, people don't look this question at the same time when they they moved. And if you are now doing the research that and say that on the mobility time they feel in this way, but exactly they answer the question maybe many hours later. That how, yeah. how you how you on this methodological point of view that how we put together this uh, the feelings and the mobility. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I think it's very fair to kind of like, yeah, consider the mismatch, especially temporal mismatch between when the, the person really travel and then hours later they answer that. Um, I would say, yeah, that that actually a limitation that we don't know when exactly that they answer. We do actually have the result, the, the data, because they app track everything. Um, so we asked them to carry the app and we only nudged them to say, report the trip as soon as possible. So as soon as you uh, complete the trip, sit down and complete this very short trip survey. And we hope that a lot of and actually a lot of people conform to that um, instruction from us. But then in other cases, know that indeed people wait until the end of the day and do that. There's a certain mismatch in time. Um, we just do hope that it does not distort the, you know, the result as much as say paper based survey or online survey where uh, we just asked participants to think about the most recent trip and they will report whatever they imagine, although uh, or that they feel, although um, that trip might be a day ago. Um, so yeah, I, I acknowledge there is a limitation in the in the temporal um, mismatch there. Um, I don't know how to resolve that yet. Um, and I welcome any suggestion, but I think that's pretty common in a lot of app studies. This is the question again that we, we also have developed that one app in, in our mobility lab. And then it's uh, we had that we, we would like to ask uh, the questions about the location where they stayed in some time. We can uh, on the app, we can uh, recognize this location, but we, we don't know that the afterwards they, they answered based on the same location because they, they can answer it uh, some time later. And then was the, the questions that how you you put together that if it's your, you, you mean the green area, but you don't know exactly the time, then it's maybe um, he or she answers for the next green area or, or during the mobility or during a different time. This is just to know your experience, how would you solve this um, uh, time lag uh, problem there for answering and the uh, real mobility? 
Yeah. But we, yeah. we also don't have the uh, very good uh, solution for that now. Yeah, unfortunately. And you know, if, if you ever find the answer, I would love to to hear that too, because um, yeah, it, it's something that also bothered me a lot in, in the sense that people wait forever to, to, to complete the surveys, not following the instruction that we sent out. But maybe for, for this well-being or is in general stress, maybe it doesn't matter so much that then it's, there's not this uh, short time emotion, it's more like the the feeling they feel have, I think, more during the day or longer period, then it uh, uh, can maybe uh, study better on this uh, way. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, this momentary ecological assessment, uh, I, I know the whole research field um, is, is built upon this temporal match, actually. So if you want to understand momentary feelings in this particular location, while we know that people are mobile and, and dynamic and not immobile, it is uh, it is indeed a methodological question. Uh, I wondered uh, whether you also, in those two studies of yours, uh, checked the outcomes, the, the well-being effects um, in, uh, in the range of travel modes that the people use. So whether there were any differences in, uh, in the travel mode or whether the travel mode had any effect on the well-being. And if you don't think about the exposure during travel, especially, then the, the vehicle or the travel mode strongly affects for what or for which environment we are exposed uh, directly. So any sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, so we do have, uh, I don't remember, I, pre I don't think I presented it here. Uh, we do check, a, you know, between different travel mode is more like exploratory result. We do before we get into all of this model result that I presented. Um, I think overall it's still that uh, cyclists and pedestrian more likely to be, to have positive emotions. Uh, it's pretty consistent um, with previous findings, you know, like car drivers sometimes can be more grumpy during travel and bus riders are probably the worst when it comes to, to emotions and satisfaction. So and also it's, it's one of our previous studies as well that I'm not pre presented here that we look particularly in kind of modes of travel activities we conducted when this person's travel, whether they listen to music or they talk to friends and so on. Um, and so it's interesting to see kind of a variation in modes as well. As for modes versus well-being, um, uh, sorry, modes and exposure, um, I think because this two study, I kind of, uh, especially the second study, we we look at the mode, but then we lump all of this daily experience together. So if you travel by car and then you bike somewhere and then you walk somewhere, all the things that we did here is like calculate the cumulative exposure for all this mode. So we no longer tease out each mode per person, but more so like this is the range of your travel and this is how much your exposure and this is your end resolve well-being. But that that might be interesting things to see if if we just tease out everything, both mode and well-being and mode and exposure and see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Especially when we think about the implications of the study and, and like the practical interventions that can come out of that. And if you want to have arguments to support active travel, and then we can also link this uh, exposure and exposure related well-being to, to the exact mode that, that people have used. But I so much like about, I like your cumulative approach. Uh, uh, and this is the, like the daily based approach is really a way how to aggregate those individual trips um, as the full exposure actually matters for health uh, in, the, in the end. And, and you like so nicely brought out that all these green areas, blue areas, different type of air, air pollution, different uh, or, or the noise. Uh, I wonder whether you have also thought of working with, uh, with other sounds than noise, for example, nature sounds, bird sounds, or people talking or the dog, dogs barking, and whether this can actually affect differently uh, personal well-being while, while being on travel, especially on foot. Or um, uh, yeah, 
So, so these kind of things like different sounds, heat, perhaps thermal comfort, especially again when we are walking or cycling and not in the conditioned air have a, a vehicle that we, that we have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What about that? Yeah, I I really like that idea. I think is that your study that you look at the or I I don't remember someone presented really cool findings that is not ours. We don't have a chance to look at uh, exposure to natural, you know, really nature sound like bird chirpings, very pleasant or like, you know, everyday kind of sounds, uh, dog or, or cats or things like that. So I think this is really a, a good question to ask uh, for future research or I think you know, if, if you have done that, I'm interested to see in that too, because we all the time we think of noise as something very unpleasant, but apparently not always. Um, even in the urban setting, I would say if, if we stop long enough to pay attention to the bird chirping among all this traffic noise, it's still very different effect as compared to like we just zip through this particular street and don't pay attention to the surrounding and environment so so maybe something if, if you file something i would love to see how it is um also you know uh, as i said how long do we really or do we really pay attention to the surrounding environment or we just like happen to be there and and go away right away so it's kind of being in the moment being present is something maybe i like to see more in in future research yeah yes uh as, as the lower speed is related also to our observation capacity uh, of the surroundings. So, so again, when we walk uh, or when we cycle, then we are more able to actually pay attention to the to the surroundings than, than when uh, when using higher speed uh, vehicles and travel modes. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yep, yeah, please. If I may, uh, what you mentioned in uh, your limitation section was uh, quite problematic or not representative data set that you used. Uh, at the beginning, you also mentioned number of respondents that you had. I was wondering how you get them. Uh, I mean, if you just promote it on the website, if you started to collaborate with the city or what was your approach to that? Yeah, uh, definitely there's this the sampling part. Um, so it depends on the three studies that we have in, in Virginia in Washington DC, we use a lot of uh, channels to get to participants. We we reach out to neighborhood association, which is kind of an association of um, you know residents of each neighborhood, and we reach out to most of the neighborhood association in the study area. Uh, so they will distribute our ads to their listserv, which is like our residents there. We don't have a lot. We didn't have a lot of participants going through that channels, although we try. And there's also we sent out to all the listserv of Virginia Tech where I was a study was based. Um, and a lot of uh, other study, uh, other university in the region in Washington, D.C. We also put a newspaper, um, student news, uh, the university newspaper and university news. And we went through uh, several marketing panels as well uh, so so a lot of a lot of effort to get to this 153 people basically but in minneapolis uh, later that when we did that study is actually through neighborhood association but the compensation level is much higher and that boosts the participation rate substantially uh, although with the, with similar kind of uh, recruitment methods for a Columbus study, we recruited through I think Facebook ads, social media ads. So we kind of have a targeted um, say we want people to live in Columbus, a metropolitan area. We want that people are age uh, 18 year old to say 80 year old and so on. And we set out some criteria and uh, Facebook next door social media will kind of spread that advertisement to local people. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I was wondering how you did it because your study area was, let's say, much bigger than I used to do because I came from Czech Republic, so we are much smaller. Our cities are much smaller. And when we are doing this kind of research, we always try to cooperate with, with the local government. 
because uh, they are in, let's say, in much stronger touch with the citizens. Uh, so from our experiences, it, it's well able to communicate with the cities, with their representatives to, to promote our research. And always we are able to get, let's say, acceptable response from them and to, to get an uh, acceptable number of participants. But uh, it's different, different country, different environment. It's uh, probably not so much comparable. So that's only my experience from a different country. I think it's a very nice, yeah, a very nice example of collaboration between the university and the local municipality. As actually, the, the broad aims are the same to do social good and then reach yeah. better understanding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I was uh, wondering also uh, whether whether any of those studies, or, or, or particularly the, those two studies, whether they also actually led to some um, me measures uh, that were taken by the university, for example, or by the metropolitan state. So, for example, the Ohio State University daily mobility study. I assume it was ordered by the university itself, and they they wanted to have some underlying information about their like staff and students' mobility behavior, but were there like other outreach um, aims of that one? So uh, this is I is called we OSU mobility studies, but it's not conducted by or not by any department in in uh, at Ohio State. It is uh, my colleague Joe Byers, the PI, and I'm a collaborator on that, and so we. We are we we brand the study as OSU because it's yes this part funded by OSU and uh, but the research itself everything was was from us and so it's not conducted by the university in on the purpose of of creating different changes or adapt that to the student or faculty or staff travel unfortunately. Um, we have not yet kind of translate any of this to uh, practice, um, although, you know, usually I would say um, the translational kind of knowledge between research and practice here in the US is quite a slow. Um, so what we wish was, OK, when it's published, we could, you know, put that in the in the planning, we can have a conversation with the local planning agencies. We could have a conversation with the planning commission of the university. We could do something in the sense of advocating for cycling and walking infrastructure. We can do something in terms of like shifting people to more sustainable modes or creating bike infrastructure or um, but but then the the vehicle emission things are you know at the state level at the federal level and a lot of this is um, is really take a long time. But I'm I do hope that we had a lot of engagement when conducting the study, especially the ongoing part of of mobile sensors, um, is that we are engaging with the local planning agencies. We're working with the state. Um, environmental protection agencies. We had a lot of conversation with them and they're super interested in like seeing the results and having some of, you know, working with some of our data. They also share a lot of their data with us. So that's, that's a very positive note. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen next uh, when we complete the study and they might take some of that into recommendation. Uh, fingers crossed. It's really, really good to hear uh, that. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, I have one more question. So the, have you studied also this uh, multimodality or how, how if the people need to change a little during the uh, change many, many times during the day, the different transportation modes or have you doing different changes in walking or biking and public transportation or car, how this influence the well-being or the stress level? Have you studied? Yeah, that's a really good question of multimodal transport. Um, and I think it's more realistic for non-car users because I don't have a car myself. And and yeah, the, the question of like how I'm going to transfer from bus to this bus or uh, if I go somewhere, transfer is a big deal. Um, I have not studied this, although I would say I'm curious about the fighting if somebody's studying it. Because I agree that the kind of there's there's the few components that pop up in my mind when you you said that 
you know, those multimodal things that might, might affect the well-being level is that um, in our previous studies of public transport users, it's so stressful. There, there's a reason why public transport users are so unsatisfied with their travel. It's, it's a lot of things that are out of their control. And I would say same for multimodal transport users, maybe the level of control that they have, the quality of the transportation service and infrastructure might be a big deal in addition to environmental exposure. And so um, and that would be a, a really an interaction between the transportation part and the land use urban form, um, you know, built environment thing. And, and that would be interesting to see if we, maybe that's something missing here now that you point out um, that we we study mono um, modal transportation and and we omit the fact that a lot of us are actually multimodal thank you I, I i wish i have the answer but i was just like oh i'm excited about the question rather than i could answer it yeah um and perhaps in European context, the multimodality is even more like topical or more in use. And I think it's also uh, the future of urban transportation at large uh, to connect the, the main public transit lines with the first and last mile solutions, for example. So, so indeed, uh, that is a great, like, great context also to study, uh, study the exposure and, and the outcomes of physical and, and uh, mental health. You, when you when you talked about the sensors, I have two more questions if we if we still have time. Uh, uh, first, first about the sensors, the carry-on sensors, portable sensors that uh, you and your colleagues are are developing. So, how do you see how the urban centering landscape should be built up? So that should there be or should the research also be conducted based on these kind of individual carry-on sensors that your your uh, strict sample. Uh, carries with them so you can match the environmental conditions with their exact mobility and the mood and the emotional outcomes or is it better and for the research in the long run better also if the stationary network of uh, air pollution or noise pollution even or, or other environmental qualities also heat we, we have very good meteorological data and, and modeling so whether to have this kind of high resolution longitudinal dynamic stationary sensor networks rather than those carrion sensors which are designed for that exact uh, study? You know, that's a great question to bring up. I think in a world of unlimited resources, I would choose both. But mm -hmm. if I had to make the trade-off, it really depends on the research questions and it really depends on like our long-term goals of doing research. The reason we do the static networks of sensors is out of logistical feasibility. And also it's, it's, it's a very kind of convenient way to, okay, now we have a pilot study, we could set up the sensors there. But like you said, if we are to, to really want to scale up the study, we want to look at longitudinal change in air quality, for example, having a network there is great. We also rely on, you know, machine learning or geospatial creaking or other methods so that we can learn about uh, concentrations everywhere in the city and then we can match that back with the GPS tracking. Of course, that is model based and of course that's not ground true data. Um, I can I can totally see the strength of carrying sensor. Um, there's a few things that I would say that kind of a barrier for, for us to adopt is one is uh, that the carrying the kind of very portable sensor like that are less well calibrated as compared to kind of purple air sensor that we used. And because we also need to convince a whole audience of en environmental engineers to understand or to appreciate like, hey, we really use high quality. We, we had experts here that are working with sensors and we are very confident in the quality of the measurements that we had. Uh, the, the portable one is less well calibrated, and so it's, it's something that we are um, kind of debating. And two is that, yeah, like you said, if we want to kind of scale up the study, if we want to take a look at environment of, of longitudinal change, then 
we always have to roll out the study. It's, it's very costly to have participants carrying that. A lot of burdens. It's hard to recruit them in the first place. Um, and so I think all of that, because we end up with choosing the network, but um, that said, we're totally happy if there's if there's way to incorporate both of, of both approaches. Yes, I also see the, the strong synergies between those uh, two approaches and, and the big, large, like national or municipal systems, they they have even longer time lags and, and to set up the system. So we have to act quicker in the research field and uh, do our own measurement equipment and prepare them uh, very often. But the other question was then related to the equity matters that you also raised in the very beginning. So could you have or did you have any chance to to check for the socioeconomic or social demographic uh, and ethnic background in your two studies and also see the results uh, in the range of those those factors. Yeah, I think if I remember off the top of my head, it was it was a result about gender and income. So uh, I did not include that in the slide, but because a lot of this model is at multi level, we focus on a trip and things. But overall, uh, the mental well-being is is lower for low income and women with, uh, you know, in a larger household. And that makes sense. Sometimes I kind of have a hard time to tease out the effect of like, OK, it's because of the, you know, uh, household responsibility burdening women in general, or, or is that racial discrimination that burdens the um, racial minority population in our sample, or is that because of environmental exposure? It's, it's a hard thing to kind of tease out this effect. But for sure, that, that's something about uh, socioeconomic difference. Okay, thank you. And, and I think that with this note, we also uh, are about to stop our today's event. It has been a great honor, uh, Dr. Le, to host you here today in our online lecture series. It's a very fascinating talk, and uh, thank you for the discussion as well. And we hope for hope to continue our, our collaboration in the future. And we very much hope to hear about your uh, new results or the results of your undergoing or ongoing research. Thank you so and much. The order is all mine. Thank you. Uh, and tomorrow. On Friday, uh, May 19th, we will have the very final event uh, of this lecture series and our postdoctoral researcher Karl Saidla uh, will hold his lecture about um, active transportation policy uh, for what, uh, why and how. So thank you for today, uh, everyone uh, who participated online, online, on site and who will also uh, check the, re the recording uh, later in the future. Thank you so much, uh, William, as well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.